Good morning. My name is Justin, and I will be your conference facilitator today. Welcome to Chevron's third quarter 2024 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session, and instructions will be given at that time. If anyone should require assistance during the conference call, please press star and then zero on your touchtone telephone. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded. I will now turn the conference call over to the head of investor relations of Chevron Corporation, Mr. Jake Spearing. Please go ahead. Thank you, Justin. Welcome to Chevron's third quarter 2024 earnings conference call and webcast. I'm Jake Spearing, head of investor relations. Our chairman and CEO, Mike Worth, and CFO, Emer Bonner, are on the call with me today. We will refer to the slides and prepared remarks that are available on Chevron's website. Before we begin, please be reminded that this presentation contains estimates, projections, and other forward-looking statements. A reconciliation of non-GAAP measures can be found in the appendix to this presentation. Please review the cautionary statement on slide two. Now, I will turn it over to Mike. All right. Thanks, Jake. This quarter, Chevron delivered strong financial and operational results, returned record cash to shareholders, and achieved project milestones that are expected to deliver production and cash flow growth over the coming years. We continue to see strong performance in the Permian and executed major turnarounds at TCO and Gorgon ahead of schedule. Worldwide production increased by 7% from the prior year and set a third quarter record. We started up the high-pressure anchor project and began water injection to boost production at the Jackson St. Mallow and Tahiti fields. These projects, combined with additional project startups through 2025, are expected to grow Gulf of Mexico production to 300,000 barrels per day by 2026. We've expanded our CO2 storage portfolio, adding over 2 million acres offshore Western Australia. In September, the FTC completed its review of the company's merger with Hess. And we also recently announced several asset sales as part of our ongoing portfolio optimization efforts. This quarter marks the one-year anniversary of the PDC Energy Acquisition. We've successfully combined the two companies, taking best practices from both and applying them across our shale and tight portfolio. We've exceeded our guidance of $500 million in combined capital and cost synergies by more than 30% and have delivered more than $1 billion in incremental free cash flow since acquiring PDC. Chevron's well performance is 40% better than the DJ Basin average, and we continue to optimize development plans. We have advantaged inventory, with around 75% locations at a break-even below $50 per barrel. We expect to hold production at a plateau around 400,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day through the end of the decade. And our operations in Colorado are among the lowest carbon intensity assets in the industry, benefiting from tankless production facilities that lower greenhouse gas emissions by 90% compared to older designs. Where possible, we utilize grid-powered rigs that reduce more than 60% of our on-site greenhouse gas emissions from drilling. At TCO, the team continues to deliver consistent progress on project milestones. All four pressure boost facilities are now online and operating with high reliability. All production is flowing through these facilities, which allows optimization of existing plants and enabled the highest daily production in the field's 31 years of service. Remaining metering stations are all under conversion, and we're confident in the incremental well capacity that will feed FGP. We've initiated final leak testing for the wet sour gas compressors, and are preparing the crude processing systems for operation. Complex commissioning activities will continue over the coming months, leading into initial startup activities in the first quarter of 2025. We continue to divest non-core positions at significant value. We've announced asset sales in Canada, Alaska, and Congo that will contribute before tax proceeds of approximately $8 billion. Pending regulatory approvals, We expect to close these transactions in the fourth quarter. In Canada, we received a compelling offer for our KBOB DuVernay shale position and non-operated interest in the Athabasca oil sands project. Both are good assets, and we have a long history there, but they're a better fit for a reputable counterparty at an attractive deal value for Chevron. 
Now, I'll turn it over to Emer to discuss the financials. Thanks, Mike. We reported third quarter earnings of $4.5 billion, or $2.48 per share. Adjusted earnings were $4.5 billion, or $2.51 per share. Organic CapEx was $4 billion for the quarter, in line with our budget. Our balance sheet remains one of the strongest in the industry, ending the quarter with a net debt ratio under 12%. Cash flow in the third quarter was the highest for the year, despite lower oil prices. Working capital decreased by $1.4 billion on lower inventory levels. Share repurchases were a record $4.7 billion at the top end of our quarterly guidance range. Our financial priorities are unchanged, and we plan to use our strong balance sheet to reward shareholders consistently through commodity cycles. Compared with last quarter, adjusted earnings were down about $150 million. Adjusted upstream earnings were down mainly due to lower liquids realizations and high DNA at TCO, and partly offset by higher listings. Adjusted downstream earnings increased primarily due to favorable timing effects and higher U.S. volumes. This was partially offset by lower U.S. refining margins. Adjusted third quarter earnings were down $1.2 billion versus the same quarter last year. Adjusted upstream earnings were flat. Lower liquids realizations and higher DDNA were mostly offset by higher liftings and timing effects. Adjusted downstream earnings decreased mainly due to lower refining margins. All other was down primarily due to interest expense. Third quarter oil equivalent production was up around 70,000 barrels per day from last quarter. Strong production in the Permian, primarily in our company-operated New Mexico assets, was the main driver. We expect full-year average production growth to finish at the top end of our guidance range of 4 to 7 percent. Costs always matter in a commodity business. We have a track record of managing unit costs well below inflation while successfully integrating several acquisitions. Higher returns require competitive costs and safe and reliable operations. Executing turnarounds on budget and on schedule is a key performance driver, and we've delivered outstanding performance in 2024. Our teams have collaborated across upstream and downstream to standardize the approach to these complex maintenance events. Increasing the days our facilities are online and lowering unit costs. While we anticipate significant volume growth in the years ahead, we also expect to deliver $2 to $3 billion in structural cost reductions by the end of 2026. These cost savings will largely come from optimizing the portfolio, leveraging technology to enhance productivity, and changing how and where work is performed, including the expanded use of global capability centers. Now looking ahead, In the fourth quarter, upstream will have downtime, which is expected to be split between the U.S. and international operations. Impacts to production from divestments are expected to be around 45,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day for the quarter. Downstream will have higher planned maintenance, primarily at El Segundo and Pascagoula. We will also have a shutdown at the Pasadena refinery, enabling the light tight oil expansion to come online. We anticipate affiliate dividends to be around $1 billion this quarter. Share repurchases are expected to be between 4 and $4.75 billion in the fourth quarter, unchanged from prior guidance. Proceeds from asset sales are expected to be about $8 billion before taxes in the quarter. Back to you, Jake. That concludes our prepared remarks. We are now ready to take your questions. We ask that you limit yourself to one question. We'll do our best to get all of your questions answered. Justin, please open the lines. Thank you. If you have a question at this time, please press star 1 on your touchtone telephone. To allow for questions for more participants, we ask that you limit yourself to one question. If your question has been answered or you wish to remove yourself from the queue, please press star 2. If you are listening on a speakerphone, we ask you to please lift your handset before asking your question to provide optimum sound quality. Again, if you have a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone telephone. And our first question will come from Jean Ann Salisbury with Bank of America. Hi, good morning. Uh, the main feedback I have heard from investors hesitant on Chevron is wanting resolution on TCO startup and tests. 
At what point should investors consider TCO startup largely de-risked? Is there like a specific milestone in the commissioning and startup process, like like where you've listed here, where you could say, okay, a startup probably really can't slip much from here, and are we there now? Yeah. So thanks thanks for the question. Um, you know, we are making really great progress, and I think you you saw that again this quarter, as we've had several quarters now where we've laid out expected milestones and delivered on them. So the the team is delivering predictable uh, commissioning and startup activity, and I ran through some of the current state relative to low pressure production, strongest uh, you know day of production ever, uh, et cetera. Uh, that said, there is still significant complex commissioning work uh, still ahead, particularly on the future growth project. Uh, that work is is well underway here, um, and we expect, uh, as we said, to uh, to begin startup procedures in the first quarter. So our cost and schedule guidance is unchanged. Um, you know, one of the key things for us, and this is a learning from from other projects over the years is uh, to ensure reliability, we want to make sure that that we have everything ready to uh, start up safely and then run reliably as we go forward. And so we're going to continue to uh, be very methodical in the way we go uh, go about starting up uh, the equipment there. Uh, but it is <clears throat> every quarter that passes, it's being de-risked. I don't know that there's a magic threshold where you can say it's entirely uh, de-risked, but uh, everything we say uh, or everything we see is uh, is very positive. In fact, uh, Emer was there just recently uh, along with Mark Nelson. Maybe Emer, you can share some of the things you saw at, at TCO. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And yeah, it was great to be back and to be with Mark and Jake and the team in Tengiz. And um, when we were there. Um, they actually achieved a key milestone the day we arrived in Tengiz, and that was when they fully transitioned to feeding all of the existing six production trains um, with uh, with low pressure production fed through the pressure boost facility. So I think the fact that the production was at um, high levels uh, producing through the pressure boost facility just shows the high reliability that's been achieved there. But we also visited three uh, sites at Tengiz, Jinan. The, the first one was the Operations and Control Center, and there we, we saw how they're leveraging the advanced process control technology, digital tools to really optimize production, keep the plants full, and plan plan work safely. So that was great to see that that they've been part of the, the project um, and is really enabling a whole new level of optimization. We went to the sites that Mike talked about where the, the complex commissioning is ongoing, so the 3GP site, the third generation uh, site, and there's a large, um, a high number of equipment that's being commissioned there. So we, we talked to the team about how diligent they're being to ensure that um, we do the performance testing on the equipment, we commission the equipment, uh, and we do that in a very methodical way. So that was great to see. Uh, we also went to the, the third generation injection facility. And with the design that we have, we will be injecting all of the produced gas into the reservoir to help with pressure management. And they were doing injection testing when we were there. So that's a, a key bit of de-risking to know that the wells will take the sargas um, into the back end of the reservoir. So overall, it was a great visit. You know, we came away really encouraged by the, the work of the team, um, by the consistent progress that's being achieved, um, but also by their, just the rigorous planning and thought that's going into ensuring a safe and reliable start up and ramp up over the first half 2025. Thanks for the question, Gina. And our next question will come from Neil Mehta with Goldman Sachs. Yeah, good, good morning, Mike and, and team. I just want to spend some time on the Permian. You had indicated in the prepared marks that you expect to finish towards the top end of the 4 to 7 percent range in guidance and you highlighted uh, strength in uh, company-operated New Mexico. Can you spend a little bit more time unpacking that, the sustainability of that, and just how sh should we think about the path to ultimately getting to plateau at this asset? Yeah, Neil, we uh, we did have a nice strong uh, quarter again in the, the Permian. I realize you know, a lot of our activity now being in New Mexico, uh, the data is not quite uh, as timely and transparent maybe as in, in on the Texas side. Uh, and so you may not see that. But uh, 
A couple of things. Number one, uh, our new well performance has been very, very strong in the Delaware Basin. Uh, we've got a, a lot of that uh, in the third quarter in particular. We're in the second bone spring and uh, seeing top quartile performance uh, out of those wells. Uh, also, in the uh, on the Texas side in the Delaware and the Wolf Camp A, we're, we're outperforming expectations. So new wells uh, and the, and the uh, completion to pop time uh, on those new wells has been very, very strong. In the base business, we're seeing... Um, stronger reliability performance. Uh, proactive maintenance efforts are, are paying off. Uh, we're seeing artificial lift optimization now, uh, sustaining strong production. And, uh, and we're seeing efficiency gains in uh, everything from completions designs, uh, coordination and logistics to uh, reduce mobilization. Uh, we've talked about triple frack before. And so uh, across the entire uh, activity, uh, you know, portfolio in, in the basin, we just continue to see improvement in the execution of that and then improvement in the performance of, of the wells. As we uh, move towards the, uh, you know, the, the million barrel a day mark uh, next year, uh, we will begin to, uh, to, to shape our profile there a little bit towards a plateau. And uh, we'll really begin to focus on free cash flow. And, uh, and so growth will become less the driver, and free cash flow will become more the driver, if you will. Uh, so we'll bring capital spending down. And, uh, and I think what you'll see is uh, this year is probably going to be the peak in, uh, in Permian CapEx. And as we move forward, we'll start to attenuate that. The growth, which has been at a you know a 15% CAGR for the last three years, probably going to be higher than that this year, um, will begin to attenuate as well, and will really open up uh, the the free cash flow there. So uh, more to follow in terms of uh, you know exactly what that looks like. I'm sure people are are curious about that. So we'll uh, we'll provide more guidance here um, you know over the next uh, the next call or two, uh, so you can you can start to think of what that looks like. But the you know the headline here is. Uh, continued efficiency and productivity gains, strong free cash flow today, and uh, we're going to manage it for even stronger free cash flow in the future. And the next question will come from Doug Leggett with Wolf Research. <clears throat> good uh, good morning. Sorry, I uh, <clears throat> had a frog in my throat, Mike. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to ask your question. You know, if I could observe um, as a kind of precursor to my question, you, you're, you, this is probably your best operating quarter in quite a while. So congrats at share prices responding accordingly. Um, but if we look at your relative underperformance um, since you announced the Hess deal, there's clearly a huge you know, weight of uncertainty on the stocks, basically wiped out the value of Hess. So it is a Hess question, and it goes something like this. You've now got FTC since we last spoke on the last call. You've got the shareholder vote, and you're moving ahead with, I guess, what many would think were the post-Hess uh, acquisition uh, disposals. Um, the synergies presumably are not related to Guyana. Why not go ahead and close the deal if you're so confident in your legal position? Well, uh Look, you know, the relative performance of the, the shares relate to a lot of things, number one. And, um, and so I, I wouldn't dispute the fact that the Hess uncertainty is, uh, is, a, is a material contributor. Um, but as you said, we, we've had some performance uh, uh, unevenness that we've, I think we've, we've you know, ironed out, and we need to prove that. But, uh, uh, you know, we announced the, uh, the cost and schedule update to TCO during this period of time. So there's been a number of... A number of things uh, that uh, I think are all, all part of that, all of which are a high priority and, uh, as you see today, are getting a lot of attention and, I think, improving. Uh, look, we've got a, uh, we've got a deal structure uh, with Hess that uh, has a condition precedent that uh, if there's an arbitration, the arbitration has to be concluded. We are confident that it will be successfully concluded, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the way we set the deal up, and we're going to execute the transaction the way the transaction is, is written, and uh, integration planning is, is going very well. Uh, we're working very closely on everything that we can at this point in the process to prepare for the future, and uh, I realize that the, the timing on this is, uh, uh, is unfortunate, but uh, we're continuing uh, to move forward and look forward to integrating the two companies and, and being really the premier um, oil and gas company prepared for the energy transition. Thanks, Doug. 
And our next question will come from Baraj Borkataria with RBC. Hi there. Thanks for taking my uh, question. Um, I wanted to ask around the uh, Canada sales. If I go back to the the Hess deal, you know, the rationale was to buy you know, long cycle, high quality resource, and obviously it helps diversify your portfolio. And, and Guyana is very different to Canada, obviously. But could you just talk about the decision to execute that divestment? Uh, one now ahead of the arbitration decision, uh, which was a surprise, but also more broadly, you know, I would have thought you were a net buyer of of kind of long cycle resource. So if you, do, you could just talk about how you're thinking about that and how you're thinking about the portfolio, that would be helpful. Sure. So, so Baraj, we've got a long history uh, in Canada. Uh, it's been a good business. Uh, AOSP has been, um, you know, a steady contributor of cash uh, for, for for many years. Uh, but uh, you know, we've also indicated that as a twenty percent uh, non-op position, it wasn't really viewed as a core uh, asset in the portfolio. So, uh, as as we were marketing the unconventional position in the, the KBOB uh, Duvernay, we were uh, not actually marketing AOSP, uh, but the buyer came to us and uh, and proposed buying both, and uh, made us a very uh, attractive offer to buy both. Uh, you know, the Duvernay, while it's a good asset, was struggling to compete against the, the strength in other parts of our shale and tight portfolio. And um, uh, and, and AOSP, uh, you know, as we've indicated for some time as a non-core asset, uh, we were willing to consider offers for it. But there was a long time when I think potential buyers were struggling to uh, give us the value that we saw, to, to your point, for a, a long duration asset. Uh, the Canadian producers are uh, are faring better today. I think their equity uh, valuations have have recovered, and, um, and and so we were presented with an opportunity to uh, to transact at what we thought was good value. And we've been patient. Others have left the oil sands over the years uh, at what we felt were were discounted values, and we weren't prepared to do that. But when we got a value that we thought was was a fair value. Um, you know, we were we were prepared to transact, and uh, uh, you know, yes, we want to add good quality and long duration assets to the portfolio, but we have uh, a lot of those in our portfolio today, and so uh, I don't think you should read um, our desire for those kinds of assets to say that anything that would kind of broadly fit under that heading. Uh, is not eligible for uh, potential divestment. We're going to continue to high grade our, our portfolio over time, and as we add quality assets and uh, use technology to improve the value of, of uh, assets in our portfolio, we'll always ask ourselves if uh, if kind of the balance of the portfolio has more value to others than it does to us, and be willing to entertain that that kind of a question. Thanks, Baraj. And the next question will come from Josh Silverstein with UBS. Hey, thanks, guys. Um, just on the, the two to three billion cost savings, how much of this comes from the announced eight billion dollars of, of asset sales year to date versus what maybe comes from additional asset sales and, and structural cost savings? And then any split between upstream or downstream? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Josh. So let me talk you through kind of our plan here, given that it's uh, it's some new. Um, material. So, first of all, as you saw on the slide, we've been disciplined in managing our costs competitively over the years. So, this program is essentially our next set of cost reduction steps to sustain um, our, our discipline, given that in, in our business, costs are always matter, they're, they're always important. So, what we're focused on here is reducing absolute costs while we deliver significant growth in the business. Um, think about uh, this program as focused on the controllables, and we're expecting run rate reductions to be realized over the next few years by the end of 2026 from a 2024 baseline. So the full benefits will be seen uh, in 2027. So in, in terms of where the reductions coming from, the, the first uh, category um, is really portfolio actions. So examples like what we've heard today in the call on the, the Alliance Canada, Alaska, Congo sales. So there's there's a, a large portion of this is associated with that. Um, we see the direct costs be reduced as the asset transfer 
um, from our portfolio, and then we would expect overhead costs associated with those assets to reduce over time. So that's um, that's one part of this program. The second part is just improvement initiatives, and these are initiatives that we see across the organization. They're coming from the business units in all segments. They're coming from the functions. Um, you know, some examples of what um, we're talking about here is, you know, initiatives that leverage technology solutions to reduce cost, um, drones, robotics, digital twins that have transformed how we think about operating and maintaining our facilities. Um, that would be an example. Another example would be um, improvement initiatives that really look to how we do our work, where we do our work. Uh, an example there would be the, the recent announcement of the Engine um, Global Capability Center um, in India. So in these centers, we'll, we're looking to standardize and centralize more of, of our workflow. So that's really what the program is. Um, you know, when when you think about the range, you know, what I'd say is the, the first $2 billion, think about these as divestments and cost reduction and cost reduction initiatives that are, are in our plan, they're firm, they're either execution ready or working towards becoming execution ready. Um, think about the, the third billion as an additional target that we have with initiatives that are underway that we haven't fully quantified. They're not execution ready. We have work to do to make them execution ready. So that's you know how I would describe the range and you know we expect um, to provide updates on these initiatives. We'll do that through 2025 as we execute on them and we deliver results. Thanks. And we'll go to Devin McDermott with Morgan Stanley. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. I wanted to ask about uh, the balance sheet and shareholder returns. Your, your net debt ticked up a bit quarter uh, over quarter in 3Q versus 2Q, up in support. Um, uh, strong buybacks, and you're still well below your long-term targets. You have cash coming in the door from asset sale proceeds, uh, as you noted, between now and year end, and then nice inflection in the Permian and TCO cash flow into next year. But I guess my, my question is, given how volatile uh, commodity markets and oil markets specifically have been in, in recent months, how do you think about continuing to use the balance sheet to support shareholder returns versus you know, tapering it back and, and, and waiting for potentially lower commodity prices over the next few years? So balance sheet use and how you think about that is the core of the question. Yeah, Devin, let me let me just address share repurchases, and then I'll let Humer talk uh, about the balance sheet. Uh, uh, <laughs> recent volatility in commodity prices, uh, to somebody who's been in this industry for 42 years, uh, is not new news. Uh, that is uh, that is the way this industry works, and um, and we're in a volatile cyclical commodity business. Uh, so, uh, you know, the backdrop is is nothing. We're not well prepared for. Uh, first thing is, I just want to reiterate our guidance. You know, the, the share repurchase uh, run rate of $17.5 billion is unchanged. The range we've given you, you know, kind of brackets the way we execute the program. And we were, you know, a little bit above the, you know, the midpoint of that here this most recent quarter. Uh, we got a strong track record of, uh, of buying back shares, which is our fourth financial priority. And that's after, you know, making sure we can sustain and increase the dividend, where we've got a track record of doing that for 37 years in a row. Um, reinvesting uh, in organic projects to grow future cash flows to support that. So the second priority, the third is to maintain a strong balance sheet. We've got a double A credit and uh, below 12% uh, net debt. And uh, and then the you know the fourth is to return excess cash to shareholders through share repurchases, which we've done for 17 of the last 21 years. And so consistency in uh, in financial priorities, consistency in execution is uh, is very important. And, uh, and I think we've got a track record uh, that we can stand behind there through commodity price cycles. Uh, you know, over the, the last 20, 21 years, where I said 17 of the 21 uh, that we've repurchased, uh, we've seen a financial crisis. We've seen a pandemic. Uh, we've seen uh, OPEC, uh, you know, open up the taps and, and, uh, and, and, you know, commodity prices respond accordingly. And so we've been through down cycles. We've been through unexpected uh, circumstances and have maintained this strong track record of shareholder distributions through it, in part because we've maintained a conservative uh, financial position and a very strong balance sheet. Uh, I'll let Emer talk a little bit more about the balance sheet. Yeah, thanks, Mike. 
Uh, Devin, you know, when we look at the balance sheet, um, you know, we're focused on um, maintaining its strength through the cycles, right? It's an asset that we use to create value, um, to navigate the, the volatility that Mike uh, talked about and reward shareholders consistently. So when we look at our debt um, levels today, our net debt under 12%, that's at the low end of where we've been um, over the last 10 plus years. So we're, we're under levered and, and given this and all the growth that, that's coming um, and the additional asset sale proceeds that we're expecting in the short term, um, we're comfortable with, with where we are and um, you know we anticipate the net debt will come down a little bit in the near term with the asset sale proceeds that are coming, but we're, we're planning um, with a multi-year time horizon with um, a through cycle um, approach, and, and we're very comfortable with where, where we are right now with the balance sheet. Thanks. And moving on to Lloyd Byrne with Jefferies. Hey, good morning. Um, first, congrats to you and your M&A team. I think the divestiture uh, progress has been great. Um, I want to follow up quickly to Baraj's question. AOS, AOSP seemed very opportunistic. Does that change your long-term goals? And then really I want to ask about the DJ and see whether uh, – I mean, it's just really impressive operating progress there. Um, synergies, free cash flow. But I think the surprise has to be you guys holding it flat to the end of the decade. Maybe you can just comment on the opportunities there and whether there's more opportunities for scale. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I, just to quickly touch on, on AOSP, uh, you know, there was one kind of most logical buyer, right? And it was the operator, and uh, we've had discussions over the years and, um, and have not been able to really get to a, a common view on value. And so that's what's changed. And so uh, if you want to say that's opportunistic, that's fine. Uh, but uh, uh, we really wanted to uh, to realize the value that we saw in that asset, and we've we've been able to do that. Um, the the um, the DJ uh, look. You know, the first thing I'll say is the uh, integration there and the synergy delivery continues the track record that we've had over uh, a long time of exceeding our synergy commitments. And uh, you know, when we do a deal and we come out with a, uh, a target. It's intended to uh, give you a high confidence, uh, you know, uh, number that you can use, uh, and we've done the diligence we have at that point, and, and you know, our track record is we find more and we, we deliver more. Um, we're very happy with the quality of the asset um, and uh, and the ability to uh, to drive strong performance. We've learned uh, from each of the companies that we've acquired. I talked a little bit about the lower carbon footprint there. Uh, we've seen some other things. Uh, uh, like uh, gas lift and uh, and U-laterals that uh, that have been used by some of these companies that we're starting to uh, work with in some of our other parts of our portfolio, and uh, and the last thing I'll say is the team there does a wonderful job of balancing this uh, multi-step permitting process. And I know there's been some concern expressed by people about the regulatory environment. Uh, you know, we're working very closely with the, the regulator in Colorado to ensure that we uh, can uh, achieve their objectives and that we can achieve our objectives. And I'd say that's a very constructive uh, relationship. Uh, we've got comprehensive area plans in place that de-risk the, the longer-term development. And, uh, and, and the quality of the asset, uh, you know, 400,000 barrels a day out through the end of the decade, you know, three years ago, we had zero in the DJ Basin. And uh, so very pleased with it. Uh, we're, we're big there. We're the biggest operator there. If the question was, are you going to acquire some additional positions there, uh, I wouldn't say that's high on the priority list. The, the real key is to drive value uh, out of this asset. And the next question will come from Betty Jing with Barclays. Morning, Betty. Again, Morning, Betty. Betty you're, again, Betty, your line is open. Perhaps you were just on mute. I was on mute. I'm sorry. Um, good morning. Thank you for taking my question. Um, so I want to ask about Gulf of Mexico. Um, feels like there is a bit of technology renaissance that's happening in GOM, and um, including Anchor project that just came online. Um, can you talk about how the technology is opening up 
new resource opportunities for GOM for the uh, Chevron portfolio? And does that represent any upside to how you think about the longer term um, production and resource opportunities in that area? Yeah, uh, Betty, it sure does. And it's an extension of the uh, story of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you know, initially on the shelf as people moved from onshore to offshore, then out into the deep water, and we began to uh, uh, develop techniques to explore and uh, and ultimately uh, develop and produce in uh, deep water, now in the ultra-deep water, and in the ultra-deep water now at ultra-high pressures and temperatures. And, uh, you know, the breakthroughs on the Anchor Project, and it's the first one uh, to be producing with uh, 20,000 PSI technology. I, I mentioned last week in something I was doing just to help people understand that. That's essentially uh, the pressure that would uh, exist if an elephant, a full-grown male African elephant, were standing on a quarter. Uh, and so it's incredibly high pressure. These are high temperature uh, fields. That the Everything that goes along with that needs to be uh, capable of dealing with those pressures. That includes uh, you know, uh, trees, blowout preventers, uh, et cetera. We have a three million ton hook load now on the um, on the the drill ships, uh, which is the highest hook load we've ever seen. Uh, that opens up a lot. Uh, uh, at least uh, you know twenty percent of our exploration portfolio is going to require this kind of uh, capability. Uh, we're using other things like ocean bottom node seismic now that helps us better characterize development and exploration opportunities. Think of it as 4D, essentially, uh, uh, technology out there. Uh, we're working on AI tools to uh, help guide exploration focus areas and predict geologic risk uh, factors more effectively. So, yeah, the uh, I think the history of the Gulf of Mexico has been technology advancements to continue to allow us to identify and then produce resource out there. It's a vast area. The Mississippi River is, um, you know, was an, is an, and was an incredible, incredible conveyor belt for organic material out into the Gulf of Mexico over geologic times. And, uh, and the industry isn't done there by, by any means. I think there's a, there's a lot left to go. Um, and maybe the last thing I'll say about it is, uh, you know, this is about unlocking uh, new opportunities. We're also working hard to make better use of existing uh, infrastructure uh, with nearer field development, uh, the ability to tie back at longer distances and develop smaller uh, uh, discoveries that wouldn't support a, a standalone greenfield uh, development, but can very easily uh, tie back as a brownfields to an existing facility. Ballymore is a good example of this, and uh, and I think you're going to see more of those as well. So the the uh, the the heyday of the Gulf of Mexico is far far from over. And the next question will come from Paul Ching with Scotia Bank. Hi. Good morning. Uh, morning, Paul. My uh, good morning. Yeah. Uh, you have a, an excellent uh, uh, production uh, uh, record in both the Tangi and uh, Gorgon that they have done well. And it's particularly impressive that uh, given both of them, you have turned around. Uh, it looks like the turnaround has done well and maybe that come in uh, faster than uh, the scheduled time. So is it a one-off or that you have changed the process so that uh, this is a repeatable uh, benefit that we could expand in the future. Well, it's 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 the latter, and we've been working this um, both upstream and downstream because these facilities are starting to look a lot more similar than they are different. And uh, and to deliver higher returns, uh, one of the keys is to execute turnarounds well, uh, ensure the work is, that's done uh, enables reliable uh, operations uh, in between turnarounds, and uh, and to continually improve on this. You know, I mentioned earlier that Emer was just out in uh, in Kazakhstan and has been at Gorgon um, not too much earlier. Uh, Emer, maybe you can talk a little bit more specifically about what you're seeing on turnaround execution. Yeah, no problem. And thanks, Paul, for the question. Yeah, to Mike's point, I mean, our complex facilities, whether they're in refining or upstream assets like TCO and Gorgon, um, they're 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 more similar than different. And so this has been an area of focus for us to try and standardize how we approach these complex turnarounds to really drive performance. So we've been working on it diligently for, for a few years. And I think the the improvement actions that I would point to um, would include maybe 
The first one is just how we think about the scope of the turnaround. And think about this as, as looking at all the units and equipment and di discerning, can I do the maintenance work on the run or do I need to do the maintenance work only when the plant is shut down? And so there's a lot of improvement being delivered because we've been very diligent about um, discerning what's in and what's out. We call that rigorous scope management. Um, the second improvement talks to the digital tools that we've used to really help with not only planning, but execution and prioritization. I'll give you a couple examples of the digital tools. Digital tools that help us with permits, digital tools that help us with isolations, digital tools that help us with leak um, testing and flange management, um, in addition to digital tools that help us with managing the span and control, given that these turnarounds bring in huge numbers of personnel at once. Um, that, that's another area. The third one, which I believe we've taken to a whole different level, is benchmarking. And um, we benchmark turnarounds, we benchmark the the units, but the benchmarking that we're doing today, they go, the benchmarking goes down to the equipment level. And so just the rigor in the benchmarking to look for improvements and to learn where we can be more efficient is, is yielding positive results. Then finally, I would say we have experts in this area from an org capability perspective. We have employees that have spent most of their careers in turnarounds, they're masters in turnarounds. And so we have looked for opportunities to share resources and to cross pollinate with these experts so that the lessons that we learn in TCO, we can learn them in Gorgon and vice versa. The lessons that we're learning and refining, we can implement those lessons learned in the upstream. So all of those things coming together has really driven a step change in our performance. Um, with nearly nine turnarounds executed this year, almost all of them have been delivered at industry level performance. So we're very pleased of this work given the criticality of it to base business excellence and we're, um, these, these results are, are industry leading. Yeah, Paul, eight out of the nine turnarounds were executed in line with first quartile duration targets. Uh, the Gorgon Train 2 turnaround was our best Gorgon turnaround ever uh, with a 14% improvement in duration. Uh, the TCO KTL1 turnaround uh, was a 23% improvement in duration compared to the last one. And uh, in several of our refinery turnarounds, saw cost decreases of up to 50% compared compared to the prior uh, turnaround of that same unit. So uh, I think there's some real quantifiable progress that you can see across the uh, across the system that's being achieved. Thanks, Paul. And the next question will come from Bob Brackett with Bernstein Research. Good morning. If I return to the structural cost reductions, and I want to put it in the context of the relocation from uh, California to Texas, is that relocation an opportunity to the cost reductions, the ability to, to redesign processes and, and organizations, or is it a, a threat to the cost reductions where there's, there's chaos and, and lack of continuity? How do you think about that? Uh, I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a threat, Bob. We're gonna. We've we've talked about the relocation occurring over a, a period of time. We're gonna be very thoughtful about uh, moving work from uh, one location to another, moving people from one location to another. Not not all of the work that's being done in Santa Ramon necessarily will go to Houston. So it may go to these global capability centers that Emer has talked about earlier. Some of it we may find technology tools. Uh, that help us to do the work more efficiently and uh, and automate things. And so um, I think it's a little bit of a, a simplistic reduction to think about just lifting and shifting everything from San Ramon to Houston. It's a migration of work to uh, different technology platforms, different locations, and um, and we'll we'll do that thoughtfully and methodically over uh, you know over a period of time. Uh, we'll make sure it's been planned out and uh, and de-risked. And so, um, you know, I think it's part of a, an ongoing, uh, you know, work evolution in a global company that has a workforce around the world uh, that can do work in many different places uh, that historically did a lot of work in business units because that's the way it had to be done. Uh, but now there's other ways to approach this work, and uh, we're looking for ways to do it best, uh, to deliver the best work product uh, and do that at a, at a cost structure that's ever improving. Thanks for the question. And moving on to Lucas Herman with BNP Paribas. Yeah, thanks very much. And um, afternoon, Mike Ema. Um, 
Uh, fairly obvious question, I guess. I just wanted to talk to you. I, I wondered if both of you could talk a little bit more about CapEx going forward. And maybe it's, in a, it's an inappropriate time and December will be better. But if, if I look at what's happening with the business, you know, obviously Tenga starts up. You've got your, your assets in the GOM coming coming on. You're talking about, you know, driving for free cash or driving for NPV value in the Permian, CapEx coming down there. If I think about the current rate of, you know, CapEx spend, including, you know, associates, it feels as though it's around 18, 18 and a half billion dollars if you go at the beginning of the year. If I look at the opportunities for that CapEx to start to fall as projects or as, as production plateaus or projects come on, it feels as though, you know, maybe three, four billion of CapEx opportunity sits there or opportunities to or CapEx decline. Yes, it's there. What's really hard, Mike Emer, is, is to see, you know, where that where that goes. Um, particularly given, obviously, everything going on in the East Med at the moment. So, you know, is it right now to start thinking about CapEx coming down very materially as we move forward over the next two, three years and you're really starting to benefit more emphatically from a portfolio that, in essence, is, you know, deep in resource but pretty long duration? Sorry for the long one. Yeah, so you've, you've covered a lot of waterfront there, Lucas. Let me let me try to address some of it and then I'll let, let Emer share some of her thoughts uh, number one, I think an important point is if you look at the rateability of our, our CapEx, uh, we used to have a program that had a lot of big, uh, you know, long duration capital projects. There was a pattern where the back half of the year, fourth quarter in particular, tended to be a little bit heavier. First uh, quarter, a little bit lighter. We're, we're very rateable now. We've been about $4 billion on our organic CapEx, you know, all three quarters this year. Uh, so it's become much more rateable and predictable. Uh, that's a reflection of the nature of the, the projects that we're doing. Uh, point two, uh, you, you talked about CapEx coming down. A decade ago, our CapEx was $40 billion. Uh, today, it's um, you, you bring in affiliates, as you say, it's 18-something, 18 18.5 or w- whatever the, that number is. Uh, so it's less than half of where we were. So it's come down substantially, even as production has grown, as the company generates more cash. We're doing it. Uh, in a much more capital efficient manner than we ever have before. And uh, and then point three is, yes, we will continue to seek further ways to optimize and improve the capital efficiency of our company. A larger portfolio uh, does over time require capital to maintain it. And so uh, therein lies the trade-offs that you, you evaluate as you look at uh, uh, your capital investment opportunities, the readiness of those uh, to move into execution. And uh, I think in the near term, you know, what's very clear is our affiliate CapEx will come down next year as the, the project in Kazakhstan concludes. Uh, uh, so you'll see affiliate CapEx come off. Um, you know, we're in the process right now of finalizing our business plan for, for 2025. And so it is a bit premature for me to guide you to that number. Uh, but we're, uh, we're looking at all the trade-offs in that, and we'll talk more about that uh, after we complete our planning process. Uh, but our intent is to stay very disciplined, uh, which I think is something we've demonstrated here over uh, you know many many years now. Uh, our guidance range of 14 to 16 billion dollars is unchanged, and uh, and I, I think you should expect us to respect that. And if that does change by some quantum, and you you, you throw out some larger numbers there, uh, you know we'll we'll cover that with everybody and talk about how to change how it's changed, why it's changed, and how you should think about what that means going forward. You know, do you want to add anything to that? I think you've covered most of it, Mike, given that we're, you know, putting our plan together uh, right now. Lucas, all I'd say is, you know, the the projects that you referenced and how we see the CapEx profiles coming off and the the free cash flow growing as those projects complete, it's a a key focus for us. So we'll give you more information uh, on a fourth quarter call as we uh, complete the process. We don't want to get ahead of the process right now. Thanks for the question. And the next question will come from John Royal with J.P. Morgan. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, So could you talk about your uh, position in California and the downstream, um, still having two refineries there, and we've had uh, another closure announced over the past couple of weeks. Is shutting capacity something you've considered in California, and and, uh, how do you think the market will be impacted by this latest closure? Do you think we'll see uh, structurally higher profitability uh, there as a result, or, or maybe things will adapt kind of back to where they were? Yeah, John, uh, first of all, uh, 
I think what what I would say is we've seen another ill-conceived move by a state that has implemented policies to deliver its residents the highest gasoline prices in the country. Uh, this uh, most recent action to insert uh, state bureaucracy into turnaround planning and inventory management is likely to uh, is to make prices uh, go higher, not not go lower. Uh, putting bureaucrats in charge of centrally planning key segments of the economy hasn't worked in other socialist states, and I doubt it will be any different in California. Uh, policies that constrain supply uh, faster than demand is adjusting uh, create more volatility, and they tend to create the, a greater likelihood of, of higher prices. And so, um, unfortunately, uh, these measures are advertised as doing the opposite, but the reality is, for anybody that looks at them and, and, and thinks them through, uh, discouraging investment and constraining supply uh, when you still have strong demand uh, is going to lead to just one conclusion. Um, and so, uh, look, we've operated in California for over a century. Both of our refineries are over 100 years old. Uh, we've got uh, they're very competitive refineries, uh, and, uh, and we've got strong integrated value chains with uh, very strong brands, uh, strong customer uh, relationships, and, uh, and so these are um, these are competitive businesses that we will continue to evaluate uh, within our portfolio, like every other asset, as we've discussed earlier. Um, uh, and so we will uh, continue to meet our customer needs and compete. We'll evaluate uh, alternatives if and when uh, it becomes evident that, that that's the appropriate thing to do. Uh, but I'll tell you, it's very tough to justify any new investments uh, in, uh, in, in that system, and uh, it's only getting tougher. Thanks for the question. And we'll take a question from Roger Reed with Wells Fargo. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Roger. Um, I guess I'd like to ask you, Mike, uh, the LNG markets globally, um, you know, we've seen some some new units get delayed. We've seen a couple other companies this earning season talk about, you know, the outlook in terms of uh, supply-demand balance kind of favoring tightness in 25. Just curious how you look at it and maybe if you could remind us your, you know, contract versus spot exposure so we could think about how uh, how that might play, uh, you know, the to the margin potential for Chevron in 25. Yeah, so, you know, uh, LNG demand continues to grow, uh, but uh, it comes against a backdrop of very healthy inventories. You know, you asked about 2025. Uh, inventories in Europe are uh, strong for this time of year. Inventories in the U.S. are very uh, healthy for this time of the year. You see that reflected in uh, in Henry Hub prices. And so, uh, overall, we've got uh, you know a, a market that currently has uh, healthy inventories and um, and reasonably good supply. Uh, becomes somewhat weather dependent, uh, and so you know that can change with a, a very cold winter. But um, but right now, I would say uh, you know it doesn't look like 2025 is setting up to be a particularly tight market. Uh, uh, you know, and then longer term, of course, we we have supply coming on in uh, in Qatar. Uh, we've got supply coming on in the U.S., and so there's more supply coming to that market. Uh, and so I think in the you know the, the short to medium term it's a it's a market that is not really prone to uh, becoming nearly as tight as what we saw a couple of years ago when the situation in Ukraine began. Uh, our particular portfolio is uh, 80 plus percent uh, contracted uh, primarily um, on oil indexed pricing on long term contracts. You know most of our sales are into uh, uh, into you know uh, North Asia. And, uh, and and 20% or less uh, spot exposure, uh, and a lot of that is is out of uh, our West Africa position, and uh, and we'll have some some spot cargoes from other other parts of the system occasionally, but primarily long-term contracts, primarily tied to uh, to crude price. Thanks, Roger. And moving on to Nitin Kumar with Mizuho. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, Mike, I wanted to just maybe touch ba touch a little bit on the chemicals uh, business. It seemed like it was a bit of a tailwind to earnings um, this quarter. What are you seeing uh, from your supply chain, particularly in Asia? Um, you, you know, you, you've heard about um, s some um, um, 
uh, stimulus to be offered there, but just just looking at at what the earnings look like for the chems business. Yeah, you know, we actually um, uh, polyethylene chain margins have uh, have strengthened over the course of this year, so it's been um, it's been an improving market backdrop. Some of that, I think, has been some short term supply disruptions in 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 certain areas. Um, you know, these are long cycle commodity markets that uh, uh, demand grows uh, kind of steadily, but slowly supply comes on in big chunks. And so uh, we've had a market that's been uh, a little bit oversupplied, and uh, and that's put pressure on the olefin chains, uh, you know, particularly in, in Asia. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think uh, over time we expect to see margins improve. Uh, we've got a couple of projects that will come online in the second half of this decade, and uh, you can't time these things perfectly, but uh, you know I think they're come they're likely to come on after the trough and into a into what's an improving uh, olefin chain market. Uh, one of those projects in the U.S., one in the Middle East. Asia is the big market, obviously. Uh, naphtha and uh, naphtha cracking uh, being the alternative. Uh, you know, you do have uh, some interrelation on margins with uh, crude oil prices, and if at the margin, you know, Asian naphtha crackers are what um, uh, an ethane cracker in the Middle East or the U.S. is uh, is competing with, you've got some interplay between those two. And so uh, we'll watch it over time. Uh, CP Chem is a well-run business. GS Caltex uh, in, uh, in Korea is a well-run business, and uh, we've seen these kinds of cycles before. Uh, we remain very, uh, you know, constructive on this sector uh, over time, uh, as we think the fundamentals will be very good. And, and CP Chem, in particular, has a lot of ethane-based feedstock, which makes it very competitive. Thanks, Nitin. And moving on to Ryan Todd with Piper Sandler. Thanks. Maybe um, just hey, good morning. Um, maybe one on the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, could you maybe just provide a status update in terms of kind of current operations, the Tamar expansion efforts, um, the next leg of potential expansion or commercial development there, and and what impact I guess what is and is not happening or moving forward given uh, the current uncertainties in the region right now. Sure. So uh, obviously, you know, the, the first priority is the safety and well-being of our employees and the uh, integrity of the assets. Uh, we have seen uh, the demobilization of the pipeline vessel uh, that was working on, uh, you know, the current expansion projects at both Tamar and Leviathan uh, as, uh, you know, the contractor uh, concluded that, uh, you know, the, the current risk environment was one that, um, you know, they were not comfortable with. We see both of those projects still being completed late next year. Uh, we'll keep you advised. You know, obviously, this will depend on uh, when that uh, is uh, remobilized. Uh, but we've got uh, projects underway in the short term at both uh, Leviathan uh, to increase production uh, you know, by about uh, 200, or, you know, 200 million uh, cubic feet a day to 1.4 BCF. And uh, uh, tomorrow is about half a billion uh, cubic feet per day from 1.1 to 1.6. Uh, so those are on track for, for late next year. We've entered feed for a, a larger expansion uh, at uh, Leviathan uh, that would uh, take us up uh, you know, significantly more. There's some room on the platform to add more processing capacity. That's a project that would be completed towards the end of this decade, uh, and, and we're in feed on that now. So more to follow. Uh, I think in the short term, obviously, you know, we're going we're gonna to make sure people are safe. We've had to um, actually uh, take production at uh, uh, Leviathan down a couple of times because some of the risks in the, in the region. But we're meeting all of our supply commitments, uh, both in the country and to regional customers, and uh, have been able to do that despite, uh, you know, the, the conflict that's been underway. And our last question comes from Alistair Sim with City. Uh, hi, Mike and Amy. Uh, Mike, you talked earlier to the operator term in possession. I, I just wanted to get a sense of what you're seeing in the, in the non-op and royalty piece. Um, you know, are, are we seeing a two-speed operating system in the basin with respect to what various operators are doing? Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, we've seen strength across all three of the, the components of our our business. Um, 
Our co-op growth uh, this year, as I said, is probably going to be a little bit higher than the 15% we've seen the last three years. Um, royalty may be a little lower than that, NOJV a little bit higher. Um, I don't know. I think I, I think you said, do we see a two-speed development approach? I, 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 don't, I wouldn't say that. I'd say we're all kind of in the same the same fairway. Uh, certainly, some of our NOJV and royalty is in highly attractive sweet spots, and I think the economics on that are very uh, very good for our um, our, our partners or our uh, operators where we hold the royalty interest. And um, and I wouldn't say there's uh, significant enough variation between our program and what we see with 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 others to describe it as a two speed program. If that was if that was the question. Thanks very much, Alistair. I would like to thank everyone for your time today. We appreciate your interest in Chevron and your participation on today's call. Please stay safe and healthy. Justin, back to you. Thank you. This concludes Chevron's third quarter 2024 earnings conference call. You may now disconnect.